I'd like to welcome everyone to our services here this morning at Christian Chapel. I uh, appreciate the presence and, uh, of course, an announcement given on the uh, telephone yesterday and a reason for uh, having a somewhat of an abbreviated day. And I uh, appreciate your consideration in that and your cooperation. There will be some more announcements uh, later on to follow, but uh, let's begin in worship and song. And John Ross Cone will be leading our singing this morning. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to start with O Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <clears throat> o Thou Fount of Every Blessing, to my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of Pray that it's not 
selfish prayers and the things that we want, but, but the things that you have willed to us and the things that uh, we don't understand in some kind. So many on our prayer list this morning that um, need to be lifted up to you. We're so grateful that you know their names, you know their names, just like you can number the hairs on our head. There's an awesome God, an all knowing God. We're just so thankful. We can lift these names up to you, these people up to you, and pray that you put your comforting hand on them, and that they might be healed of their afflictions, that they might soon return to their normal walk of life and enjoy the pleasures that, and blessings that you've given us on this earth. Pray for those that are mourning, especially the Walker family, and Seth, Brother Steve, and be with you at this time. And all those to those of us and others, brothers and sisters. Just pray that you might use us, use our hand or feet, that we might comfort them in any way we can physically. And we know that you were them spiritually. We're so thankful for that. All those this week, Heavenly Father, that I suffered loss, we pray for them. Anyone this time in need of our prayers, and you know their names. So thankful for this congregation and what it means to the community, to the county, especially to the people at the end here. Help us continue to be in love, unity, and harmony, that we can enjoy the fellowship with one another, that we can go away each time that we have fellowship, knowing that we've been in the presence of God and we feel better. Thank you for Brother Bobby that he's addressed our mind this morning with words. Pray that it might be a light to us that we can go out and shine that light and not let us just know around us. Help us Christians, that we do have the Spirit in us and moves us and helps us and controls us and that we can do the things that you have us to do. Thank you for John Ross and his ability to sing, we sing in the church and come up and do that in the afternoon. Others, I pray for Derek, of course, for his family, as we can say, along with so many others who are struggling with this uh, trial. Pray for our country, young Father, that they might look to you for the wisdom that they need. That they might turn to the things that you've laid out and that would make a good society, that would make a good um, place to live. And that's what we need so bad at this time, is that we return to you. And, um, Look to you for far guys and not look to their fellow man. If we study your Bible, then Father, we pray that you'll give us the insight that we need to understand it, that the Spirit leads in us, that we can learn from it, that we can do the things you have us to do. Most of all, we thank you for your son Jesus Christ who came to live on this earth, died on that cross, and defeated death that we might have that plan of salvation before us so that we can have that hope of eternity in heaven with you one day. So thankful for that. Go with us now through the service. Again, forgive us our sins. Help us that we might forgive those who sinned against us and that uh, continue in this life. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God.
sometimes as a maybe a far-fetched idea because the negative so easily gained rather than the positive and that hangs us up it uh, causes us to lose focus and sometimes drift off our path and go into areas and in, in dark places and look for uh, methods to cope but I want to give us a message of encouragement and anytime that any of us need to be encouraged there's only one place that we can go and that's God's word if you believe God's word if you don't believe it you might consider it good reading but if you don't believe it it won't take it will not take hold of you like it should if you believe fully so I urge you, if you don't believe in the Bible, if you don't believe that this is God's inspired word, that it is a living, living word, that it is active, that it can do things, let us help you with that. In the book of Ephesians, this is one of, one of the richest epistles of the Apostle Paul as he really highlights the church, its role in the world, who its head is, that being Christ, its function, but yet in this day and time, the church is in, has been born into a society that is utterly godless. That's one measure of encouragement that we can gain. We, we look around in our world today and we, we see the hurt. We see the heartache. And we wonder, as Sam suggested a moment ago, we wonder sometimes, does, does God really understand what's going on? And I will assuredly say, yes, he, he knows. The prophet Habakkuk had the same question. How long, God, will you stand and, and see this take place and do nothing? And God's reply to Habakkuk was as if he wanted to tell him what couldn't. Matter of fact, God would tell him that even if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. And so through God's word, through his church, the message that the church gives, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, one of the purposes, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known, the rulers and authority in the heavenly places, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness, and access with confidence through our faith in him. Verse 13 says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. And those of us know, or Bible students know where Paul is when he writes this letter. When Paul says, I'm suffering for you, and again, for his readers to read this and then to understand that, that Paul is writing from a jail cell uh, through no fault of his own. He is not guilty. He's innocent. He's in, he's in jail. He's in prison for being who he is and that being a follower of Christ. 
And see, the, the society that day were antagonists against Christians. And it would be very easy, easy to be discouraged by someone that I know who has been falsely accused and falsely imprisoned, and we can get hung up on that negativity. And we can allow that to consume our, our thoughts and our life. Paul says, I, I don't want you to do that. Basically, Paul says, I'm, I'm okay. But I'm suffering for you. Don't lose heart because of this. And then he opens up a thought that I think is one of the most beautiful sections of all his epistles. <clears throat> when he says, do not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. He says in verse 14, for this reason. What reason, Paul? Well, the reason that I'm suffering for you. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do so far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power that work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? That from a jail cell. Most of you know, some of you may not, I used to work in jail. <laughs> I never received anything like this through the, the, the door to pass on to somebody else. This is uncommon to prisons. But you see where Paul's heart is. He's in jail, and he's trying to give his readers encouragement. You see how backward that is? They should be writing notes and letters to him saying, Paul, you need to just stay strong, stay strong, stay strong. But no, it's, it's evident that their letters are, we hate that you're there. And we're discouraged by your being there. And this is his reply. He says in the first place, and there's four things we've learned from this passage. Number one, his prayer was for them to be strengthened with power through his spirit. When you think of power in the spiritual sense, we don't, we don't gain power on our own accord. We don't we don't get it in and among ourselves. You know, if we could, could could consider what the opposite of power is, we might use the word weakness. And if we want really want to get down to the bottom of things, no matter how strong we may think we are spiritually, many times we find ourselves weak find ourselves weak and we don't know what to do, we don't know where to go and that's what the devil might thrive on. Our weakness. Because weakness breeds fear. Weakness shows us that we are maybe useless. And we get those thought processes in our mind and that begins to take root and take hold and it begins to be the guide for our entire life. And so we find ourselves in a place that we ought not be. In Revelation chapter 2, sometimes this chapter 2 to verse 10 is often, for whatever reason, included in, in the list of things that 
a company salvation. Revelation 2 and verse 10, John said, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. You know, and we forget what John writes prior to that. In Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, do not fear about, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. See, weakness breeds fear. And John's instruction to, to his readers is not necessarily if you stay strong, these things won't happen. He's saying these things are going to happen. But don't fear what's about to happen. And the wording suggests that when, when the devil, whomever is in, in charge, throws you into prison, you're going to be tested. We might can throw another text and say that, but in the Roman society, it's not too far-fetched to think that these people are going to be tortured. And if you read in, in world history how the Romans treated people, Everything was a game. They, they would put you in the in the Colosseum and turn wild animals on, and people got a thrill out of that. That was entertainment. And that's the way Rome operated. So it's not too far fetched to say that these Christians are going to be tortured. Sometimes we think when he says, Be faithful unto death, I'll give the crown of life. Sometimes we think of that in the wording in the way that, you know, if you die, just be faithful. Now John says, you, you, you're, you be faithful even to the death. When death hovers over you, you maintain faithfulness. Maintain confidence and do not fear. That's easier said than done. Because we don't like weakness. Some may think that it considers us useless. Well, you remember what Paul told the Corinthians about those things which are weak? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, very simply, In verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You go down to verse 27, he says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. And here's the reason why, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So when I'm weak, I'm at my, my best place. Remember in Judges chapter 7, very familiar story. Started out with 32,000 men to 5 million out people. We all know the story got down to 300 men. You know the reason why? God gave us the reason why. God told us so that you may not say you were delivered by your own hand. That whole event was to show the power of God. And that's exactly what happened. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Next, this passage teaches us that Paul's prayer was to keep Christ in our heart. And that coming from verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. How important is that? And I know this is an easy concept. 
And we, if, if we were to ask you, does, does Christ dwell in your heart? And what I mean is, you don't just think about him ever so often. The idea to suggest is, has Christ made his home in your heart? Is that where he lives? We sing those songs that suggest that. Is that the case with you? Does Christ live in your heart? Does he dwell in your heart? Paul's prayer was for them to, that Christ would dwell in their heart through faith. If Christ is not in our heart, there are things that, that we cannot do, we will not know. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, this is one of the first scriptures we had to learn as a child. The English Standard Version says, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord. Honor him as holy. The old King James says, sanctify the Lord in your heart. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet you do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that you're not slandered. Those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So does Christ dwell in your heart? Why? Because you're going to be tested. You're going to be asked. Now, why do you live the way you do? How can you, how can you respond the way you respond in the face of adversity? What gives you the strength to go on and on for, for, for time and, and dealing with difficulty? And your answer is because I have Christ in my heart. How do you know that? You know whether you've got Christ in your heart or not. That's not a difficult question. You know that Christ is living in you. You know if Christ is not living in you. And that's Paul's prayer. I pray that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith. And according to what Peter says, we can honor Christ, we can defend our faith, and we can live with integrity. Similarly, when Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians in chapter 3, he says it like this. He begins by saying in verse 8 that I may gain Christ. And it's interesting to, to consider this. When I asked Paul, well, Paul, haven't you gained Christ? Haven't you already gained Christ? Paul's desire to have the closeness with Jesus that it had never been satisfied. Even though he had made him on the road to Damascus and he had been converted, he had, he had, been, he had turned away from, from killing Christians, arresting Christians, yes. to becoming one. And to become a leader in the church and to become a person to whom the people looked up to now. He's no longer a murderer. But his closeness to Jesus has not been fully satisfied. He says, I, I want to gain Christ. I want to gain it. Be found in it. And verse 10 he says that I may know him. Not just know who Jesus is intellectually, but to know him in the sense that he has become one with Jesus. Paul wanted Jesus to dwell in his heart. He wanted Jesus to dwell in the heart of the Ephesians. Next, this passage teaches this prayer. He asked that they could know Christ 
love, and size. You know, we measure everything by size. You go to buy a house, you know, how big is it? Well, it's 1,200 square feet. Well, that's not big enough. Everything's measured by, by size. You go through a drive through they'll ask you, do you want it upsized? So we find value in size. Paul says here that you're being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. See, Size is involved in God's love, but it's spoken of in the terms that it is limitless. Now, there's never been a value, a number of value placed on, on these descriptions. If you ask your child, how much do you love me? They'll say, to the moon and back. That's a measurement. <coughs> how much do you love me? I'll love you all the way around the world. That's a measurement. Paul describes it here. I want you to know Christ's love and how wide it is, how long it is, how how high it is, how how deep it is. And this same sentiment is suggested in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? We've heard this passage. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As, as it is written, for your sake or be ye all day long or regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Paul says, no, 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 no. And all these things, we are more than conquerors with him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, or rulers, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing deep enough that can take away God's love. There's nothing high enough that can escape God's love. When the psalmist wrote in the 139th Psalm, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, behold, you are there. Even there, your right hand will hold me. When Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, and, and we know those, the depths of the sea are, are unknown. But what did Jonah do while he was in the belly? He prayed. Was he able to escape God's ear through the depths of the sea? Absolutely not. And if he went as high as the heavens, would, would he be able to be closer or be escaped from or evacuated from God's presence? Absolutely not. And that's the encouragement that we can gain, that we can know Christ's love in, in its limitless size. That even in our, our lowest times, that, that God still looks upon us and He loves us and he, he wants us to have that closeness with Him and that through Christ. And we include that phrase through Christ because Christ has lived with us. Christ knows what pain is, He knows what loss is. And we think of him always being the son of God and he just cast those things off. And he was the son of God. Absolutely. He was God in flesh. But yet he was a man. Now as <clears throat> Joseph was a carpenter and undoubtedly as the Jewish leaders would ask him, isn't that the carpenter? He learned that trade. You know, if he hit, if he hit his hand with a hammer, it would hurt. He felt pain because he was human. He was a man. And when he, Herod had John the Baptist beheaded, you know what Jesus did in response to that? 
He went away by himself. You think the Son of God doesn't need to be alone. He, he, can, he can cast off his burden and know he's perfect. His heart is perfect because it's because of his head. God's love through Christ is what we need. There's no song that suggests Christ's love is all I need. And that's it. His love is all we need. And finally, Paul's prayer was that those people could know the love of Christ in mind. See, there is an intellectual component to this. But this passage suggests that the love of Christ goes far beyond logic, knowledge, comprehension, because he would say in verse 20 of that of that section, Ephesians chapter 3, now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. Far more. What we think Christ and God can do, he can do more. We can't wrap our mind around that. But we have limits. There's only so much love and support and, and encouragement that, that we can offer. And we're, we're limited in that. And God is. There's no limit to his love and, and for us to understand that.
Now we come to this very important part of our worship as, as Christians. The time in which we reflect, we go back to the cross and remember the, the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf, the, the blood that was shed, that through this blood we can all have eternal life. I'm going to read a very familiar passage this morning from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. We will read the verses 23 and 24 and then, then have a prayer for, for the bread. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this very important time this is for Christians. We ask you to bless this bread, which is a representation of Christ's body on the cross. Bless us that our minds will go back to that cross and that we will remember the great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. This we pray in Christ's name. We'll continue our reading with verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup, which he had sucked, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Thus again the Bible. Heavenly Father, we Thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's shed blood on the cross. Bless us now as we reflect on, on this great sacrifice. Bless us that we do this in a manner well-pleasing unto thee. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Also, at this time, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we give thanks and appreciation for all the many blessings that we have received and that we fulfill another commandment to, to give as we do prosper. Feel again by. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our health, our, the, the opportunities and the, the challenges that you give us each and every day. We're very mindful of our commitments and responsibilities and, and the, uh, the, the number of items that we have planned for the church to do. Bless us at this time that we'll be cheerful givers and that we'll give back to you so that we can uh, fulfill all the uh, missions of the work of the church. This we pray in Christ's name. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we're going to continue to, to try to meet, if, if, if at all possible. Uh, we understand the importance of fellowship, and, and obviously so so do you, uh, or you wouldn't be here this morning. Uh, so, so thank you for coming. We'll always uh, keep in mind your safety first, and uh, let's just all pray that this craziness the same be over and that we can get back to some type of normal. Again, I appreciate your being here. Let's remember uh, those in our community who are who are suffering tragedy, uh, those who are still sick with COVID, and those who are uh, coming out of their, their quarantine time with COVID, we're thankful for that. Uh, and let's lean on one another to get through this like we've always done. And that's the purpose of the church will bear one of those burdens. And so let's keep that in mind. Thank John also in the same as going to close out with the same. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare us a place. When we all
thankful for this time together this morning, and we pray that our worship to you has been pleasing and acceptable. We're thankful for those who were able to assemble. We're thankful and reminded of our of the command that we have to assemble and worship you on the first day of the week. And we pray that we have done this in a pleasing manner to you. Thank you for your son and for the time that we could remember him in our communion. Thank you for Bobby's message that he brought and singing, the good singing that John Ross conducted today. And we just ask that you continue to watch over us and bless us, that you be with us this week, to be with those who are sick, those that are suffering, those that are recuperating from surgery. And we pray that uh, you will guide us during this week, that you'll be with our children and grandchildren as they go to school, and, and our teachers that work with them, and may they be able to continue their in-person learning this, this year all possible. We're thankful for, again, those who are here, and we pray for those who are unable to be here this morning. Close this prayer, Father, in memory, asking you to comfort the Walker's family this week as they lay in any of the rest. We pray for Judy, for Chris, for Bridget, for Miss Walters, for all the brothers and sisters as they assemble together and remember him, love one another, comfort that family. We ask that you would continue to be with them, be with those that are traveling to be here. Thank you again for this time. May we be able to continue to assemble and we realize that, I guess more especially today, that it is a blessing and a privilege to be able to assemble and worship you. And it means probably more to us during this time than maybe we have let it mean in the past. As we continue to pray for our safety and our health and for the time that we are in now. Thank you for your son and thank you for his love. Thank you for salvation through him. And thank you for us being able to pray to you through him. In his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.